Thanks, Donna. And thanks also um, to Madison and Tara for all the tech support in the beginning. It's It takes a village to run a webinar um, and we appreciate all of your help. And um, everyone else, thank you so much for being here. My name is Caroline Brinegar, um, and I have been serving for the past two years of secret as secretary for the um, Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. And I have the distinct pleasure tonight of introducing our speaker, um, Lenny Lampell. Lenny holds an MS in environmental studies with a concentration in conservation biology from Antioch University in New England, and he's also got a BA in biology um, from SUNY College at Old Westbury in New York. Um, Lenny is currently a Natural Resources Coordinator with Mecklenburg County Park and Recreations Division of Nature Preserves and Natural Resources, and he's also the curator for the Dr. James F. Matthews Center for Biodiversity Studies, where he's responsible for a host of different very exciting things, um, including the management of biological assessments and inventories, the monitoring of federal and state listed rare plant species, and the coordination of various fauna and flora studies and projects, including the ever popular and exciting Mecklenburg County Moth Nights. Um, Lenny, we're so excited to have you with us tonight, and we're looking forward to your talk about insects and the environment. So take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you for that great introduction. I had nothing left to say. You said it all. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it is it is really, it's a pleasure to be here virtually with you all. Um, I appreciate any opportunity I can to promote the things that, you know, are involved with the work that I do, but the things that I love. And I'll make the disclaimer right away. I'm not a professional entomologist, but I do have a special interest in insects and I, I like anything that grows or moves in a natural environment. But insects are fascinating. You know, once you kind of get hooked on them, there's no turning back. Um, I guess for me, it was probably in 1998, I was working for the National Park Service um, in New York City at a wildlife refuge. So that tells you about how old I am. Um, but I spent a summer um, trying to identify and catalog species of ants on a wildlife refuge, doing dragonfly surveys, butterfly counts, and it just, I was hooked after that. Um, in graduate school, I took some entomology courses. Um, I remember my first field entomology course. Um, I just, you know, I got really into dragonflies and I ran up to the professor uh, the first day and I'm like, I'm really into dragonflies. I'm so excited for this course. You know, we're going to go out, we're going to see all these great dragonflies. And she's like, oh, she's like, yeah, I'm I'm a beetle lady. I don't really know anything about dragonflies. I was like, ah. but um, the thing about entomology and being into insects, they are such an incredibly diverse group. Um, there are professional entomologists that really just can specialize in like one family of one group of insects. Like there were some, you know, ground beetle experts that have <laughs> incredible papers and books on ground beetles. And they wouldn't know one species of butterfly from another, maybe. So um, it's that kind of thing. It's different than if you're into birds or you know wildflowers. It's an incredibly diverse thing. Um, but I, you know, I have the groups that I love. But I'm interested in it all. But most importantly, I mean, I just like when I have the opportunity to kind of promote the a greater understanding and appreciation of these animals because um, they're incredible. And it was so it's so hard doing a talk like this. Um, I'll do for our Master Naturals program, I do the entomology session and I think I have people for a full day. Oh, I give them, it's like death by PowerPoint. I sit them down for four hours before we go outside and I'm like, I got so much to tell you and I throw all this information at them. Um, Cause there really is, there's so much to say. So to try and scale it down for a talk like this, um, I, I'll start the PowerPoint and I'll, and I'll just lay it all out there. But there's a lot I wanna cover with you all. So I'm just gonna kind of fly through some material and it's all important. You have to hear all this stuff. Um, and then at the end, if we have some time for question and answers, um, I know Caroline will monitor the chat. And um, and Caroline, by the way, works in our Center for Biodiversity Studies. So she forgot to mention that. And uh, Caroline's incredible. So we are very fortunate to have her with Mecklenburg County. And I'll tell you more about that and the work that we do in the Center for Biodiversity Studies and um, insects and everything uh, as soon as I can figure out how to start this PowerPoint. So let me, okay. Has everybody seen a large insect on their screen? We can see it, yeah, it looks okay. perfect. Okay. Awesome, awesome, okay. Um, so insects in our environment is the title of the presentation, um, but what I want to, I want to cover more than that. So here's what we're going to do in the next little while. We're going to cover some insect features and life cycles, 
insect diversity and classification, insect invaders, these are invasive species, um, insects, um, insect ecology, insect loss and concerns, insect studies and conservation in Mecklenburg County, and some insect initiatives and ways that we call can help. So we're gonna pull this off in under an hour. I promise you we can make, well, we'll get, I can't promise. We'll try and make this happen, but it, so it's, there's so much to say and such good information. Um, there was nothing I could leave out, and I did leave out a lot, but this all had to be in here. Um, so just to start with, you know, insects are a really interesting group. I've given talks on all different, you know, subjects related to nature. But, you know, people have their preconceived thoughts on insects, and it's amazing the emotions that insects stir up in people. And you can just kind of cycle through these photos. You know, there's fear, there's wonderment, you know, there's uh, terror, you know, then there's joy. Um, and those emotions can change over time depending on, you know, how you build your relationship with insects. So that's my wife directly in the middle, um, and I don't remember quite where she started, but she's definitely reached a joy part with insects now. And once you start putting them all over your face, then you know you've reached that level. Um, but I want to kind of separate insects out from what the rest of what we call this kind of world of creepy crawlies, because there's some people have some misconceptions. You know, they call them all bugs, and you know that kind of term which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes is actually a scientific bug term that we have to cover. But the bug word or creepy crawlies, you know, that involves all different um, invertebrates, arthropods, um, as well as the insects. But I want to just separate, separate out the insect group. That's what I want to focus on tonight. So insects are, they are invertebrates, they are arthropods, but they have some distinct features that make them a little different than the other creepy crawlies. So the scientific class insecta, um, the things that make them a little different, they all have six legs. They have three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They have one pair of antennae, and most insects have one or two pairs of wings. So this is different than what you might find with some other um, creepy crawly things. So I love pill bugs or sow bugs, these little isopods, roly polies that we see them all the time on their logs. You know, they have important roles they play in the environment, but we're not gonna get into them today. So we're gonna stick to the insect world. So an ant has that true head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. It's different than the other roly polies. Um, it is a true insect and that's what we wanna stick with. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell, like this grasshopper, you don't really see the body segments as easily. It's got a that hardened collar that's kind of covering its thorax. Um, but it is a true insect. There's the head, thorax, and abdomen. Um, I'm not going to get into all the, and it's again, you can go on and on about all the insect features and morphology and all that kind of stuff. Um, I will point out just a couple of things. If you look towards the rear of the insect, see if you can follow my mouse. Um, but you'll see these little dots um, that are called stigmata. They're also called spiracles or spiracles, they call them too. Um, those are pores in the abdomen that actually uh, allow gas exchange, and they're actually breathing through that. So insects do things very differently than we do. So they're not taking in air through their nose and filtering down to the lungs. They are actually breathing through the rear end of their body. So it, you know, I've done insect talks for all ages, and I've gone into classrooms and talked to school groups about them, and I don't remember if, I mean, I don't think they remember much of what I tell them, but when I tell them about these spiracles and stigmata and tell them that um, basically insects breathe through their butt, I'm sure that's the one fact that they remember. So um, they do things very differently than we do. So um, again, I'm not gonna go over all the features, but the one other thing I'll talk about is that the rear of the insect is the ovipositor. Um, that's a really um, cool feature. Um, of course, it's something that belongs to the female insects. All female insects will have this kind of appendage um, for and it's for egg laying. Um, this wasp on the bottom left that looks terrifying is an ignumen wasp. Um, and that long thing that looks like a giant sticker is, is an egg laying device and it's not gonna hurt you, but we see these things and we get terrified. Um, I did take this picture of this periodical cicada and it's ovipositor is actually piercing through a twig, right through the plant tissue and laying eggs inside the twig. Um, so it's amazing the control they have over those. And, you know, over time, you know, through 
evolution, insects have made so many changes and adaptations to their environment, and they're all incredible. Um, but there was one I wish they didn't do, and that belongs to one group of insects that has kind of complex social structures. Uh, it's a group called the Hymenopter. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, but bees, wasps, and ants, um, a lot of the females, you know, they live in these complex social structures and colonies, and most of the females will not be laying eggs. They're not going to have any reproductive roles in the colony. So they don't need the ovipositor for that purpose. So over time, they've modified it and turned it into a weapon. So it becomes a stinger, which they can use in defense of their colony. So I wish evolution would have left out that one. But we're stuck with it now. Um, and then you have something like this, a caterpillar, which on the surface doesn't, you know, we're talking about the separation between insects and other arthropods. This doesn't fit that classic insect, you know, role. It doesn't have the three body parts and the six legs. It's got a whole bunch of legs. Um, but when you break it down and actually look at it, it really kind of does. It's just structured a little differently. It has, you can see it real well on the bottom of the head, thorax and abdomen. A few of these segments make up that thorax and the rest of them make up the abdomen. Um, it has six true legs and those other leg-like structures are called prolegs. Um, so even though on the surface it might not look like an insect, it is an insect. And it's just in the juvenile stage, which gives it a whole different look. And that's something we definitely need to talk about is insect metamorphosis, the changes that happen between the juvenile stage of an insect and the adult stage. And for different groups of insects, it happens a little differently. So this is, um, I don't know, I, just, I never used to love these types of insects, but now I do. They're, they're called silverfish. We see them commonly in our homes. Um, they like kind of, they'll feed actually on um, glue that's holding book bindings together. Um, and starches and paper, but um, they're very common. And they're fun if you have them in your house to watch the different stages, because you, you don't see um, what you'd see with some other insects, but you can see some small little silverfish, and then you'll, they'll get larger and they'll get larger. And it's not that complex, but what happens, um, you know, insects don't have bones inside their body. So they have a hardened outer covering, an exoskeleton, and it doesn't really allow much room for growth. So there's the, as their internal body grows, it'll push against that stiff, hard exoskeleton until the point where they break out of it and shed that, that outer coating, their exoskeleton, or shed their skin. Um, at that point, they'll grow some more. You know, that outer layer of skin, again, will harden. And um, again, once their body pushes up against it with some more growth, they'll push out of it again and break out of it. Each time that happens, it's called an instar stage. And they'll go through several of these, you know, breaking out of their skins or these moltings um, and live in several instar stages before they reach the adult form. So egg, instar stages, adult, nothing too incredible for silverfish and for some other groups of insects. Um, but for some groups um, that go through this hemimetabolis or simple or incomplete metamorphosis, um, it works a little differently. You know, they, they Again, you start with an egg stage, all insects come out of eggs. Um, and then you'll have a juvenile, whoop, get off screen. Um, in this case, grasshopper. They'll do it just like the silverfish did. You know, they'll grow, their body pushes up against their exoskeleton, they break out. Uh, again, you know, their skin hardens and as they grow some more, again, bust out of it. So they'll go through these stages. Um, but that final time they shed their skin and break out of it, um, that's the point where they'll develop fully functional wings. So those wings will kind of develop a little slowly, but it's not until that final shed to an adult when um, they're finally um, insects capable of flight. So really unique, um, but nothing compared to what happens for the group of insects that go through holometabolous development or complete metamorphosis. So here, just like the other ones, they start with an egg. Um, what comes out is a juvenile insect um, for the grasshoppers, we'll call them nymphs, but for insects that go through complete metamorphosis, we call them larvae. Um, so larvae will do the, just like the other ones do the same thing. They grow, they'll shed, they'll grow, um, they'll go through these instar stages. Um, that last stage, I don't know why that keeps coming up, um, before they reach that adult form, 
they don't just emerge and all of a sudden develop fully functional wings. They go through major changes. Um, and they call that resting stage, you know, a pupa or, you know, for moths, I'll sometimes call it cocoons um, or a chrysalis for butterflies. Um, but major changes happen between the larval and adult form of insects that go through complete metamorphosis. And I wanted to mention this, but if you really stop and think about it, I mean, it has to be one of the most fascinating things that actually happens on this planet. And we take it for granted because, you know, we know it happens. We learn about it in school. It happens in our backyard all the time in the summer. But if you, you, if you had never heard about this before and somebody told you that this insect on the top, this caterpillar, will, you know, grow and then eventually go into this resting stage and turn into a completely different animal, you would think it's something out of a science fiction movie. Um, because what happens from here to here is incredible. I mean, in this stage, you know, we used to actually think it kind of just dissolved into a soup and just completely restructured itself. Um, now we know that's not entirely true, although there are parts that kind of do dissolve. Other parts just change shape and elongate. But these changes actually allow it to become a whole different animal. There's really nothing about the caterpillar that's the same as the adult butterfly. They feed on different things. Their whole body form is different. So nothing else on Earth does anything like this. So it's this few groups of insects that have this unique thing where they really get to be two different organisms in one lifetime. And equally impressive is the diversity of these insects. So this pie chart represents all life on Earth. And it's everything. I mean, this is plants, animals, um, other invertebrates and creepy crawly things, even like protozoan bacteria and stuff. This is every living thing on the planet. And if you look at that, you can see insects make up more than half of all life on Earth, 54%. And let's see what I can advance. Here's just another pie chart that shows it in the same form. Um, but that's incredible. I mean, the diversity is absolutely incredible. More than half of all living things on Earth are insects. And then the question always comes, you know, how many species are there? Um, and it's really hard to answer that because diversity is so high. Um, but if you cite a source, you're right, right? You're correct. So you can't be wrong as long as you have a source to back you up. So. I can say to you all, in North Carolina, we know we have more than 10,000 species of insects um, because it's, it was in that book, Insects of North Carolina, which was written in 1938. Um, in the US, as a total, we have more than 86,000 described species of insects as listed in the American Insects Handbook. And in the world, we know we have greater than 1 million species. Um, and the source for that is the evolution of insects. Um, but it, it's way more than that. We, we understand it's way more than that. And depending on which experts you get information from, those numbers can be very different. You know, some estimates will lean more towards 5 million and others will trend more towards 30 million. I mean, if you think about that kind of gap, 5 to 30 million, you know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of room in between those numbers. So it tells you how much we still don't understand about insects. And so, you know, how do you, how do you even wrap your head around them? You know, I'm sure everyone who's listening here tonight, you know, we have this interest with nature and, you know, it's like, it's like living in a neighborhood, you know, you know your neighbors and you have, you feel more connected to your neighborhood. Um, and, you know, it's like that with bird, you know, we want to go out, we hear birds sing and we see them in our bird feeders, we want to know which types of birds they are. We see wildflowers blooming, we want to know what they are, you know, same with the trees around us. So you want that kind of understanding, you know, and that helps build your connection to the natural world around you. But how do you deal with some with a group that's this diverse? I mean, the 10,000 in North Carolina, at least. Um, so luckily, you, there's no pressure. You don't have to start memorizing 10,000 names. Um, but if you do want to learn more about insects, you know, you have to kind of work at certain levels of organization or classification. So if you work at the scientific groupings known as classes for insects, um, or well, I'm sorry, not the class insect, if you work at the scientific groupings called the orders, um, in North America, we have, we have them grouped into 27 different orders. And unfortunately, these change from time to time as well, as we learn more about them. Um, and that's 
that's doable, right? We can, we, you know, at least if you see something, you can say, oh, well, it belongs to this order of insects and you can feel good about yourself. You know, you have some connection to it. You understand where it fits in with other things. So I'm not going to go over all 27, but fortunate for us too is that there are about seven or eight of these, seven that are, I'd say probably about 80 to 85% of the insects we see around us would fit into these seven orders. Um, so that makes it even easier to, you know, so we'll just kind of go through these real quick. Um, but again, you know, just to have that connection to understand the groupings that they belong to. Um, you know, we see these things commonly and a lot of people might not know, you know, the dragonfly on the right and the damselfly on the left um, are very closely related. You know, they belong to a scientific order known as the Odonata. Uh, odonata meaning tooth one. Insects do not have teeth, but they actually do have a serration on their um, mouth parts that act as like a teeth where they can hold on to their insect prey. Um, so over 460 species in North America. Um, beautiful, in, I mean, if you really, I mean, we see them flying all around all the time in the summer, um, whether you're, you know, by water and ponds or streams or lakes or even over fields. Um, if you ever take a net and catch one and have a chance to hold it in a hand. They are incredible looking creatures. This is a twin spotted spike tail that we found at Reedy Creek Nature Preserve. And here's a side view of it. So just fascinating creatures, especially when you do have a chance to really look at them up close. Those giant compound eyes that they have it. They're, they're amazing to, to really, really kind of get a close look at. Um, the order Othoptera are the grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Ortho meaning straight, terror meaning wing that kind of you can kind of see it on that grasshopper that kind of straight plane um, over 1200 species pretty diverse um, you kind of separate them out the grasshoppers tend to have short antennae they're in one group and then there's the insipora the crickets and katydids and allies that have long antennae um, this is one of those this is a true katydid and i'm showing this one to you it's not a great picture but that's my hand that it's sitting on um, and we don't see them that often but you couldn't even imagine a summer night without this species of insect, because this is the, what we hear all night long in the summer going ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, and it's just it's the sound of summer. So you may not see them that often, but they're certainly a um, dominant presence for all of us in summer. Um, the hemiptera, the true bugs. So I would mentioned this earlier. I was going to get back to this bug term. So. Bug gets thrown around for any creepy crawly, but there actually is a scientific order of insects um, known as the true bugs, the hemipterans. So certain insects fall into this order, um, and the, uh, hemi meaning half, terror meaning wing, um, and you can call them the half wing insects, but they don't have half size wings. They have two sets of wings, but you can kind of see on this green stink bug the tips of one pair of wings are translucent. So when they fold their wings up, it makes this X-like pattern. That on these two, which I always get these confused, they look a lot alike, the milkweed bug on the left and the box elder bug. You can kind of see that sort of, if you can see my cursor, make that X-like pattern. Um, but these are scientifically bugs. So all, if you look at it in scientific terms, all bugs are insects. But certainly not all insects are bugs. So if you want to be truly scientific about that term, if you use the word bug, you have to be talking about a hemipteran. Um, I told you too a little bit, they kind of changed these classifications and moved these orders around. Um, I do have personal favorites. Um, this guy on the left is a periodical cicada, which I definitely will be talking more about later. Um, cicadas are one of my favorite groups. They had their own order to themselves, along with the hoppers, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, and that order was Homoptera. Now they have moved them into the Hemipterans. Now they're bugs, and that's a change that happened just a few years ago. So um, they've become a suborder of Hemiptera. I do not approve of this change, but nobody asked me. Oh, look at that face. I mean, how could you not love cicadas? So uh, we'll be talking more about cicadas, but um, uh, incredible, you know, again, you know, what would summer be without them? And this is one of our annual summer cicadas that, you know, make those great sounds up in the trees that we hear all day long. So the coleoptera are the beetles. 
Uh, choline comes from the word meaning sheath, terra meaning wing, so the sheath wings. So they have two sets of wings. Their outer wings um, are a hardened sheath. So when they kind of form a straight line um, over their abdomen, and when they open those up, they have an inner set of wings, and that's what, what they really use for flight. Incredibly diverse group, around 24,000 species in North America. I don't know too much about the beetles. Um, I do have favorites among the group, and the Eastern Hercules beetle is certainly one of my favorites. And we'll sometimes see him when we do our um, nights where we put up moth sheets and stuff and they'll land on a sheet. Um, incredible looking <laughs> big, large beetles. Um, and just some of these things are so fascinating. And like, again, I could go all night showing you great pictures, but um, this thing is a glowworm beetle. This is an adult on one of our moth sheets on the right. Um, this is the larvae on the top left. And when we shut off the light, this is the larvae on the bottom left. So fascinating. And we actually were walking between moth sheets one night without our lights on and saw this incredible little glowing structure in the, and down in the, on the ground and picked it up. And this is what it was. Um, so again, unless you're sometimes just out in the right place at the right time at night, you can go your whole life without ever seeing, you know, a glowworm larvae glowing, but it's a magnificent sight and it's, they're doing it all around our homes, you know, all throughout the warmer months. Uh, Hymenoptera are the ants, bees, wasps, and soft flies, um, approximately 18,000 species in North America. These are incredible groups of insects. You know, these are the group uh, insects that live in these kind of really um, incredible, they form social structures and there's colonies and different members have different roles that they play. And uh, it's incredible, you know, their life cycles are fascinating. Um, we're learning more and more about things. You know, I just mentioned beetles and beetles were thought to be the most diverse group of insects in the world. Now people are starting to pay closer attention to some of these um, little tiny, tiny parasitic wasps that have these unique relationships with a lot of plant species where they'll lay eggs on certain plants and their larvae develop within plant tissue. Um, but scientists are thinking now that these are probably the most diverse group of insects in the world. And this is just information that's come out in the last year or two. Um, so you can kind of see this pie chart. This is just for insects now. This is insect diversity. Um, the beetles represented 38% of all insects. And meanwhile, the, all the hymenoptera, all the ants, bees, wasps, and were thought to have only amount for 13%. But in you know a few scientific studies and all of a sudden now the parasitic wasps take the lead so it just shows you how much you know our knowledge is just growing over time when it comes to insects there is still so 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 much to learn uh, butterflies and moths the lepidoptera lepi meaning scale terror wing they have scales on their wing which allow them to be colorful and have these unique markings and patterns and i think that's of course one of the things that we all love about the butterflies is because they can be colorful and well marked. Um, and the moths are in this group as well. So I'm always here to defend the moths. And this regal moth on the right, I'll argue, is as beautiful as any species of butterfly out there. Um, one thing I do want to mention, this will come back later too. Um, this is a, on the upper right, is a zebra swallowtail caterpillar. Um, and butterflies sometimes are what we call generalist. They lay, lay eggs on all, any, a bunch of different plant species or tree species, and those caterpillars will eat um, all different kinds of leaves. But a lot of them are specialists, where there's really just one species or maybe just a couple of species that those caterpillars can live on. So for our zebra swallowtail, the host plant is pawpaw, and that's what those caterpillars need to feed on. That's what the adults will lay their eggs on. So you have this interesting relationship, and it's certainly true with the moths as well, where certain species have these really unique connections to certain plant species. They just need to be around, and they would just wouldn't be there if you didn't have them. So if you do have pawpaw anywhere around you in your neighborhood or anything, then there's a good chance you'll get to see the adult uh, beautiful zebra swallowtail at some point. The dipterans are the flies. This is a group that most people really aren't that crazy about. It's the flies, mosquitoes, gnats, midges, and that kind of thing. Um, they, uh, they're, you know, you can, again, you can make case like why they're incredible, and they are incredible on their own, even though they certainly might not have the beautiful colorings and markings that some of the butterflies have. Um, 
but they certainly have very important roles that they're playing in the environment, even though some of them can be pests for us. Um, one thing that's interesting I'll point out, um, when you're talking about this group uh, with the term fly, again, that belongs to this scientific order, um, they separate the words. So if you're talking about a fruit fly, that's two words, or crane fly or robber fly, other insects that are really not flies, but use that word as part of the name, like a butterfly or dragonfly, that's put together as one word. So if it's separated, then it's a true fly. If not, then it's another group of insects. And even within the flies, I mean, there's beauty still. So every once in a while, I run across these golden backed snipe flies, and I don't even know how much is really known about them, but these tiny little beautiful, look like little glowing jewels with those gold markings on them. So even, with the, even the flies can impress you. Uh, and then there's the invasive species. Um, so there's certain insects that have been either accidentally brought here or have um, been brought here on purpose that have certainly affected things in the natural environment. Um, this is the Asian multicolored lady beetle. Um, there have been several attempts to have this beetle get established in North America. I think like 1918, they started some trials. Uh, and that went on, I know in the 40s and 50s, they were trying some things. And they really wanted to get these guys established as a way to control um, aphids, uh, ladybugs lead aphids. And if you can control the insect pests on plants, you know, garden plants or crops, um, they, they were looking at it as being a bit, very beneficial thing. Um, and it wasn't until about the 1980s that all of a sudden, you know, these trials worked and it probably worked too well. And Asian multicolored lady beetles, their populations just exploded throughout the continent. And I, I believe they're probably in every state now. Um, but in some places in the fall, you might see something like this. They do look to kind of come into shelters in the fall to places to overwinter. Um, for us, they can be annoying is probably our most biggest problem with them. Um, they do secrete like a yellow fluid, which also is very unpleasant. But um, they're affecting the native lady beetle populations. So they're more aggressive and now that they're adapting well to the north american continent um they're out competing other lady beetles so i don't even know how much is known or how much native lady beetle populations have dropped because of this but they're certainly impacting them and this is one that is probably impacting us personally on a greater basis um, it's probably impacting other stink bugs as well but the brown mommerated stink bug is an Asian species. This one was accidentally um, brought to this country and they are a agricultural nightmare. Um, they'll, they have a, they are a true bug. You can see that X-like pattern. Um, true bugs have this kind of um, stiffened mouth part called a rostrum that they'll insert into twigs or plant tissue and, and extract fluids from there. Um, and what these stink bugs do, they'll actually feed on um, fruits and vegetables. Uh, a lot of agricultural crops are targets for them, but they really have a thing for apples too. So they were first, I think it was 1996, they showed up in Pennsylvania, not too far outside of Pittsburgh and have kind of spread since then. So it really wasn't until you know 2008 or so that we started seeing them around here, but now they're, they're very, very well established. So, you know, Apple orchards for us aren't a big thing in our area, but certainly, you know, I know there's some in the mountains and places up north. Um, it's it's really been a big problem, and their populations are exploding. Uh, the kudzu bug was another one that we thought was going to be a big problem. The name is great. We're like, oh, great, you know, this Asian species is here now, but oh, this is good. It's going to eat all our kudzu, um, but they feed on any legumes. So yeah, they they like kudzu, but they also like um, soybeans. So, you know, that would that would have a big impact. Um, and we really thought it was going to have a big impact. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, they, they look like little rabbit droppings. If you've had the chance to run into them yet, you can see how large the numbers can be in certain areas. Um, they're a little more recent. It was kind of outside Atlanta in 2009 where they were released um, or, or were first seen. Again, this is an accidental introduction. I'm spread out and got to the Piedmont of North Carolina about 2011. And we started seeing them and it really got bad for a few years, maybe about two or three years. It seemed like each year there was more and more of them. And then it really kind of died back. And we just don't see, at least I've been fortunate not to see that many of them at all in the last few years. 
So maybe there's been some kind of natural control that's kind of clicked in and it's kind of kept their numbers down. So hopefully they won't be a agricultural nightmare for us. Um, I wish we can say the same thing about this one, the red imported fire ant from South America. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any natural control that's going to put these populations down. This one just seems to be, uh, it seems like it's here to stay. Um, and we all know about them. We've all run into them. You know, they're a nightmare in the natural environment. You know, they are very aggressive and, you know, any small animals that are ground dwelling, you know, are potential prey for fire ants. Um, they'll eat nestlings for in the nest of ground nesting birds, so it's just the, which are already declining as it is. So they're a major, major problem. Um, showed up out by Mobile, Alabama, but somewhere between 1918, 1930, and really didn't get to our area till you know it was probably the late 80s, early 90s. And you can see on this map, you know, from the, with the red, is it really haven't expanded too much further north from us. There's a couple of spots in Virginia, and even the mountains so far have been okay. Um, you know, with environmental changes over time, it'll be interesting to see if their range expands out more. But um, they're certainly in the Charlotte region to stay, it seems like. And one of our newest uh, nightmare pests is the emerald ash borer. Beautiful iridescent beetle, um, an Asian species. Um, first found outside Detroit in 2002 and kind of spread out by 2011. It was kind of heading down towards our area. Wasn't here yet. Um, 2015, we had the first, and that's this map on the upper left. It started showing up in North Carolina. Um, wasn't in Mecklenburg County yet, but by 2017, which is the lower map on the left, it was seemed like it was already, you know, well-established in our region. And, you know, here we are now. So they're just increasing. And again, this is going to be another one that I don't think we'll have a chance to get a hold of. Um, they, um, they're small. They're only about a half inch. You can see two adults sitting on that penny. But um, they lay eggs on tree bark and the larvae when they hatch will kind of burrow in and they'll be in the inner wood and they'll just kind of tunnel through and making those kind of tunnels that you see. And as they kind of encircle around the tree, they actually just cut off the flow of nutrients coming down. So when they fully encircle a tree, you know, the tree has no way to transport nutrients and it'll die. So um, they affect ash trees in our region only, but we do have green ash uh, is a major component of our floodplain forest. White ash is a big component of our upland forest. And um, yeah, the, the, our ash trees are gonna uh, be in trouble. And we're already starting to see some of them dying. So it's a shame. Uh, the next one that we're hoping we can keep out of our area is the spotted lanternfly. This is a um, homopteran from Asia. Um, these are the adults on the left. These are the nymphs. As they go through those, I talked about those instar stages. Um, they actually, their coloration will change from one instar stage to another. And on the right are their egg masses, which kind of look like mud or clay. And there's the egg masses again. Um, they're, they lay lots of eggs, they're very prolific. And before long, you have what you see here on the left, which is about a million adult lanternflies congregated together. Um, they have these piercing mouth parts and will just you know absorb fluids from trees and plants and they'll do tons of damage. And while they're at it, they secrete a honeydew substance that um, produces that uh, somehow it kind of creates a, a black sooty mold or encourages it to form. So then you have tons of these lantern bugs and tons of this black sooty mold that just kills the vegetation around it. So it just, it, I, it would be a nightmare if these things got established around here. And um, so far so good. Um, Pennsylvania, they seem to have been spreading the last few years. There were some pockets in Vir Northern Virginia, which I don't think they've seen them really get established at, but you know, local extensions and you know um, federal agencies state agencies are, are being pretty strong about this one there's a lot of monitoring work going on and they're trying really hard to not have these things spread and where they do see them and they are reported they're working hard to get rid of them so hopefully they don't come down our way anytime soon so uh, related to the lantern fly, but a uh, native species is this speckled sharpshooter. Uh, this is a native hopper. Um, you could probably go your whole life without ever seeing a speckled sharpshooter. And I don't know, um, there's 
you know, tons of related species like this that, you know, I was fortunate to see this one and take this picture, but it's got plenty of cousins out there that I'll probably never get to see and, or even know exist. And that's the thing, you know, the, some of these things we just don't even know about. Um, but even little insects like a speckled sharp shooter or all its relatives that I've never seen or heard of, um, we might not know they're there, but they're, they have significant roles that they're playing uh, in the environment. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how important these things are. So when it comes to, you know, insect roles in nature, you know, pollination has got to be, of course, one of the things that gets the most attention. Um, insects are major pollinators for most of our flowering plants. I think it's somewhere between 85 and almost 90 percent of flowering plants rely on insects or other small animals, but it's mostly insects to carry on the pollination work. There are some that are, that are wind pollinated, but most of them rely on um, insects to do that. So insects do it very well, some of them. Here's a bumblebee, you know, carrying tons of pollen from one flower to another. Um, this is in Lada Nature Preserve, and this is just, you know, one of the beautiful sites that we like to see in our nature preserves. This wouldn't be, if the insects were gone from Lada Nature Preserve, none of this would be possible. So flowers would not be able to reproduce. They would not be able to move their pollen around. They would not be able to produce seeds and there would not be any more wildflowers in the future. So this site is only possible because of insects. And besides pollination, there's other roles that they're playing related to plants. So the things like unique relationships like seed dispersal, we don't really think of as something insects would be involved in. But for this bloodroot flower and for some of our other really cool wildflowers and altrilliums, um, you know, as the flowers die back, you get this little seed pod and inside the seed pod are the seeds, but they have this little fleshy substance attached to them, which is known as an eliasome. This substance is a great food source for ants and they'll actually go and take these seeds with the eliasomes attached and carry them somewhere else, usually back to their colony, which may be underground but they're usually bringing it to the perfect places for those seeds to germinate. So they're moving seeds around and playing a really um, unique role in keeping blood root going. And um, again, if these you know ants, which can seem very annoying, we have all native species of ants, which again, have these unique relationships with our fauna and flora that are just vital. Like if these ants were gone, you know, we could potentially lose things like blood root and some of our beautiful spring wildflowers. And so, you know, plants, you know, again, we, they need insects, um, but so do our animals. You know, it's a major food source for wildlife. Uh, this anole has, uh, definitely has its hands full with the cicada, but that's a good meal. Um, but there's one group in particular of animals that I think of um, when it comes to really needing and relying on insects. And it's a certain group of birds known as the neotropical migrants. Um, these are birds that spend part of the year in the tropics and then part of the year in temperate North America. So, you know, they'll winter in the tropics and they'll fly, you know, you know, we can see them here in North Carolina in the spring. Some will stay, some will move much further north. Um, so these journeys involve the movement of, you know, it's thousands of miles in between their wintering and breeding grounds. And along the way, you know, they might do a couple hundred miles, depending on which species it is at a time. And then they'll have to stop and rest. So when they do that, you know, they have to kind of refuel and their fuel is is they need food. They need to have these insects available to eat. So this is a black and white wobbler that looks like it's feeding on an ant. This is a chestnut sided wobbler that has a little caterpillar. Um, if you remove the insects from the equation, um, these birds would be in major trouble. They would be gone. Um, you know, they're this group of birds already has as a whole has experienced some really serious population declines due to loss of habitat and its wintering grounds and breeding grounds and even, you know, uh, rest stops along its fly, their major flyways. But um, these insects, so the, having these insects there is, um, it's vital, they need them. So as in, if insect populations were declined severely, the neotropical migrants would decline even further. And even, you know, not direct connections, you know, like here's a mayfly that's about to be eaten by a fish. And then here's an osprey eating the fish, which should, that fish didn't just eat the mayfly, but you understand that whole food chain and there's all these connections. So even for birds that might not rely on insects directly, they're certainly relying on them indirectly. 
So you pull the insects out of the equation, you might lose some fish, and then you lose the osprey. So everything's connected. Um, and other, you know, they're doing other things in the environment too, like decomposition is, you know, insects have a great role in decomposition. You know, we all love cute little baby maggots, baby flies, like in this picture, um, but they're breaking things down in the natural environment. They're breaking down dead matter. Um, this is a dead red bat that I found at Cowan's Fork Wildlife Refuge, and I went to move it a little bit, and these two carrion beetles crawled out from underneath it. You know, really beautiful beetles, but, you know, they're there to lay their eggs on the dead carcass, and then their larvae will feed on that red bat and break it down. So, you know, important things that need to happen in the natural environment. You know, re recycle the nutrients back to other things. This is the uh, famous scientist, uh, entomologist, um, E.O. Wilson, and he's spent a lifetime researching insects and biodiversity. And that statement, you know, if we were to wipe out insects alone on this planet, the rest of life and humanity with it would mostly disappear from the land within a few months. I mean, that that's an incredible statement. Um, and it's most likely, sadly, probably true. Uh, they are that important. You know, if you think of the natural world as uh, as a machine, you know, operating all these small parts, interconnected parts working together, the insects are the engine. And, you know, you take the engine away or disrupt it, the machine stops. So, you know, we they are absolutely vital to our natural areas. So whatever preconceived notions we've had about insects coming into this, you know, you know, you, hopefully by me blabbing on about all this importance with them, um, it's so true. I mean, we absolutely need them. So, you know, whether on a personal level we love them or admire them or not, we have to understand how important they are to things. And that's what makes stuff like this scary. So this happened in November of 2018. This was the cover of the New York Times magazine. And uh, this was part of an article titled, The Insect Apocalypse is Here, and What Does It Mean for the Rest of Life on Earth? And this was really interesting, because this was, I think, one of the first times really insect, I mean, not that it's the first time insect loss has gotten major attention, but, you know, at this kind of level, um, that was shared everywhere. You know, we were just hearing about it all over the place after that article came out. And what that was based on were from a few recent scientific studies that really set off the alarm bells. So um, with the year before, there was this study in Germany where in their nature reserves, they had noticed over a 25-year period a 75% loss of insect biodiversity. Uh, they weren't really looking at species. They were collecting them in these giant malaise traps and kind of weighing them. And over 25 years, they've noticed that they were collecting 75% collecting less insect biomass. Um, so that that's scary. I mean, that's significant. It wasn't much long after that that the study came out in France that they were noticing declining birds populations by you know either a third or two third uh, declines. And for, especially these were insect eating birds. They were relating it to overuse of pesticides in some agricultural areas that were removing insects. Um, and in France, they actually you know, noted in this study that, you know, in, they knew insect populations had declined in some cases up to 80%. So the insects were going away and their bird populations were crashing. So again, alarm bells going off. Um, and then it seems like after the New York Times study, you know, these headlines were everywhere. And, you know, this, you read these, and, you know, of course, a lot of this, they like to sensationalize things in stories now because, you know, they, they need you to read it. They want that, they want you to click on it and, um, in this case, you know, I'd love to say it's all just sensationalism, um, but it is a really scary thought. I mean, the more we lose insects, um, the more it affects everything on this planet, including us. And one of the ways you kind of can relate that to, you know, our understanding, you know, we're not, if you're not out there doing scientific studies and seeing this, um, those of us, you know, who are older can remember, you know, driving through the countryside years ago, uh, you had to use a lot of windshield wiper fluid. I mean, you get bed bugs smashing against your window, and that definitely does not happen to that extent anymore at all from the way it used to be. So this, you know, what they call it windscreen phenomenon or windshield phenomenon, you know, it's a way just anecdotally to realize like, oh yeah, you know, that is true. We do not see that the way we remember it. Um, and it just, again, it tells us that these things are disappearing. So what, what do we do? So how, 
where do we come into this now? You know, knowing this is kind of the problem, you know, what are some local efforts to learn about and protect insects here in Mecklenburg County? So for, for my group, um, you know, I'm with Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation's Division of Nature Preserves and Natural Resources. And within that uh, group um, is the natural resources section. And um, our mission as a whole, and of course this group involves, besides our natural resources group, all of our nature centers, um, the Latin Nature Center, Reedy Creek Nature Center, McDowell Nature Center, uh, Stevens Creek Nature Center, which just recently opened. Um, so the environmental education staff that works there, you know, they're educating people about all these great things in our nature preserves. Um, and, you know, our group is trying to really focus on managing those nature preserves. So if you read that first line, to protect a region's biodiversity and natural heritage for its inherent value, you know, just that one line, that was it, one, two, three, four, fifth word was biodiversity. So again, you know, think of that pie chart, um, insects, they amount for more than half of the biodiversity on the planet. So there's no way we can protect biodiversity without protecting insects. And we don't really focus on single species management. We're really focusing on what it says down there in the third line, which is conserving natural communities. If we can take these natural habitats and keep them in the best condition that we can, that's going to keep the greatest assemblage of plants and wildlife. You know, that's our way to protect our biodiversity. So managing natural communities protects and enhances our biodiversity. And, you know, that's a thing that our group spends a lot of time doing. Um, if you don't manage a site, it'll look something like this. This is a plant called autumn olive. It's the green thing that you see all through there. And it uh, some of our forests are covered in this stuff and it just gets out and spreads through. It crowds out all the native species and it becomes sort of a monoculture. But again, when you um, lose native species, then you're lowering your biodiversity. When you spend the time oops, to manage the site, you're going to have a diverse, a higher diversity of plant species, which is going to give you a higher diversity of insect species. So you're going to have a greater amount of biodiversity. And how do we do that? Um, we set things on fire. <laughs> um, prescribed burning is a, definitely a tool we have to help manage things. Um, fire has played a big role in the Piedmont landscape for thousands of years. We know that. Um, and it kind of takes out some of the invasive species and it'll help promote native species, which are definitely more fire tolerant than a lot of our invasive species. Um, some of us enjoy doing it a little too much, maybe. <laughs> um, it's a it's a it's an interesting practice, but it it's incredible to kind of go to some of these places after there was a fire and watch all the native vegetation start coming back in. Um, and also just in controlling invasive species, kind of cutting them out and, you know, using herbicides where we have to. <clears throat> um, this is an invasive tallow tree that was removed. Um, this is English ivy. This was a volunteer day where they removed it from the edge of Torrance Creek. So, I mean, our group spends countless hours working on invasive species control again to encourage more native species to grow in and to enhance the biodiversity through that. And then my role is probably more focused on inventory and monitoring. So, you know, we're managing, but, you know, we want to know what we have um, here and what we're managing for. You know, we want to know how well we're doing. So we looking at certain groups of insects, you know, we can say certain things. We, we have a pretty good understanding of dragonflies and damselflies in the county. Uh, 52 species of dragonflies, 28 damselflies. Butterflies, we hit 100 species. I think actually we might be like 100, 102 now, but we've definitely crossed that 100 species threshold. And then moths, we're up to about 900 species. So um, it takes a lot of time and effort to try and document this stuff. But um, moths are, I'll talk a little bit because our Moth Nights program has been one of our biggest insect related projects lately. Um, and it's just been going on for a few years. Moths are great because you just turn on a light and they come to you. And, you know, we've had these Mecklenburg County moth nights going on for several years where from March to October, once a month, we meet in nature preserves and just spend the night documenting, you know, cataloging all these different things that we're seeing. And they're incredible. I mean, if you ever had a chance to do something like this, the diversity that you see, I mean, again, you can go your whole life without seeing some of these things unless you do something weird like stand in the woods at night by a black light and a sheet. Um, but just incredible creatures. And again, they have these connections to certain plant species. So it tells us a lot by what we're documenting, 
or what after a few years we stop seeing um the, you know you can gauge what's going on in your nature preserves in your natural environment by the amount or or the increases or decreases of certain groups of insects like moths um you know not long after we started looking at them this kind of became a big thing and people were getting into mothing um probably because they started having some resources available and they started making like field guides um so national moth week became a thing so this is believe it or not every year i think it's the third week of july people gather all throughout the country and actually kind of all throughout the world now it's kind of become a worldwide thing um and they'll gather at night together usually in an organized group and it happens in nature preserves and parks all throughout all throughout the world um and look at moths that come to the black lights at night um this is a public moth night that we did at Ans we partnered with Ant Springs Close Greenway and you know it's great to get people out there again they're seeing things they've never seen before and building appreciation um usually every year we'll do something um partnering with our nature centers to do one of these moth nights in one of our nature preserves um so you know on the left is a sheet in black light and you know we can kind of reproduce those results sometimes by putting out a moth trap which is what you see on the right um and the moths are attracted to that and there's a strong alcohol in there that sometimes knock them out and they'll fall in the bucket um we're doing some studies now to kind of put out these moth traps in some whoop, um some nature preserves that um that Stephanie Hedrick on the left where she's looking at moth populations in areas that might be more impacted by invasive species versus sites that aren't as impacted by invasive species and that'll kind of tell us more with our management efforts you know how our biodiversity is changing so you know we pull the moths out of the bucket um and in the Dr. James F. Matthews Center for Biodiversity Studies, which, whoop, which is where Caroline and I work, you know, this is this is where the magic happens back in there. So, you know, this is where we will take out moth samples. Um, you can kind of see under the, the window sign. Well, I don't know why it keeps jumping ahead, um, but those are a bunch of pinned moths. So we'll put them on pinning boards and then they can be databased and cataloged and filed away into a permanent collection. Um, and well, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, but this is important. You know, a lot of there's a lot of changes in understanding of moth taxonomy, and for a lot of these things, having specimens help. There, um, sometimes you can actually just remove a, a leg and have it DNA barcoded, and you actually end up with something unique, even though you thought it was something else. So all scientific institutions have these incredible moth collections, and we have a small one, but at least we're trying to build something representative of the diversity that we have in the county. And um, this is Stephanie going through some of her small, what we call micro moths that she collected. And in doing so, saw these little tiny hoppers. I mean, these things look like little specks, but this is under a dissecting microscope and you can just see the incredible uh, markings and colorations on these things. And you would never see these things unless you kind of take that really, really close look. So we're keeping these when we're done with the moths, we can start working with cataloging some of this diversity and trying to understand it better as well. Because again, they're all playing their roles in our environment. Um, so the cousin, this good segue into the periodical cicadas. Um, this is an insect that's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, I don't know, a lot of people have heard about this mass emergence that's going to happen this spring that I'll talk about. Um, they periodical cicadas are different than our cicadas of summer. They tend to time their emergences together in certain regions where they'll stay underground for a long period of time. For most of these year classes or broods of periodical cicadas, they'll stay underground for 17 years. Um, for others, it'll be 13 years, but they'll emerge en masse by the thousands or tens of thousands, or in some areas, it can actually be up to the millions. Um, and it's fascinating to see it's for us, we'll have it be, it's not even just one species. We get three species at one time that'll emerge. Um, and it gets a lot of attention um, just because there's so many of them and it's really loud and it's just an incredible natural phenomenon. So the group of periodical cicadas that come out in the Charlotte area are what's known as brood 14, um, or, I'm sorry, brood 19. And we did a whole monitoring project when they last emerged to try and figure out um, exactly how our populations were doing. They're underground for so long that so many environmental changes happened, development, and of course, pesticide and herbicide use. Um, so this is their range of brood 19. Um, they last emerged in 2011. They're a 13-year brood. 
And when we did our study in 2011, we sourced a couple of major concentrations. We had over 100 volunteers help us collect data all throughout the region. And really surprised that some of the places um, on the um, west side of the county didn't have major emergencies. But we noticed the Ballantyne Pineville area was a major hotspot for us. And also along the Rocky River and Concord, um, some areas we were getting more than 10,000 you know, estimates of individuals out at one time. So we'll do it again in 2024. Um, but these beautiful little red eyes will be um, popping above ground for a lot of people this spring. Um, and it's a year class of periodical cicadas known as brood 10. And they get a lot of attention because they tend to emerge in some major metropolitan areas like around DC and Philly and not too far out of New York City. Um, for us, we'll maybe see some in the Northern Piedmont in the mountains, um, but this is a bigger show in other places. Um, but you, if you haven't heard about them coming out this spring, I'm sure you will. It gets a lot of media attention and people are terrified. So other things, you know, just kind of ways to document insects. You know, we will get involved in citizen or community science projects and opportunities. Um, the Southern Lake Norman NABA butterfly count is something we do every year. NABA is the North American Butterfly Association. They do counts um, in the same places at the same time of year all over North America. And it's a way to kind of get data sets to see how butterfly populations are doing over time. So we go out at the same time of year. It's always the second week in August, I believe, on a Sunday. And we do this year after year after year. And it's a great way to kind of track changes over time. Um, and the butterflies love it. You know, they'll land on you if you don't know who they are. You, you know, you can identify them with their field guide. And, I'm, I'm just kidding. That, that rarely ever happens, but it's great when it does. But that's a Hackberry Emperor posing right by its picture. Um, but yeah, to be able to identify and catalog them and provide that information to researchers, you know, that can use this to any researchers anywhere across the country will use this data. Um, on a smaller scale, you know, the Carolina Butterfly Society, they'll be involved in these NAB accounts, but they even just lead field trips all the time you know just looking and they when they do looking at butterflies but just recording all the numbers that they see sharing this information on a listserv that you know um, researchers will compile and there's certainly folks that keep track of all this information to look at how butterflies are doing throughout north carolina uh, on the bottom is rob gilson on the left and chris talkington on the right and they um they have headed up the charlotte chapter of the carolina butterfly society so you know anyone who's interested in that they always have field trips going on so other things you know people can get involved in is things like firefly watch our fly flies disappearing you know volunteers are looking at that um it's this is headed through the museum of science in boston um caterpillars count is another program through unc chapel hill looking at caterpillar caterpillar abundance and again anyone can get involved in this stuff and just go out and collect data and report it and it really helps give um you know researchers an idea of how populations are doing um, Bumblebee Watch is a pretty new one that started by the Xerces Society and several other organizations where you can go out and look at bumblebees and take observations with your iPhone um, and then report that data too. Um, again, and just important information, you know, having people act as scientists um, gives them a chance to kind of spread out in areas we've never been able to cover before. <laughs> but, you know, volunteer community scientists are making a big difference in helping give us a greater understanding of insect populations. Um, iNaturalist is a great tool that's gotten really popular over the last few years. But I mean, gosh, you can just see something in your backyard and at least catalog it in iNaturalist. And there are researchers that pull this information. Um, so it can be anything you see and put in iNaturalist can be useful um, to researchers somewhere, who knows, even a few years down the road. So with just a simple click of the button, you can help. Monarch Watch is a great group. You can get in, you can actually get tags to do some volunteer monarch tagging on your own, or they also promote creating monarch way stations, planting milkweeds. Um, and, you know, that'll tie into the, the thing I'll close on, of course, is, um, you know, native plants. You know, again, you know, having like a stronger, you know, natural community that's in a higher condition promotes higher biodiversity. And native plants support more insects than non-native plants. So things we can do in our own backyard is planting native species 
Um, leaving the leaves, that's getting a lot of attention now, finally. You know, there's a lot of insects associated with leaf litter and some that pupate over winter in the leaf litter. So leave the leaves. That's been a, a program that Xerces Society has started recently and that they're, you know, trying to get a lot of momentum going for and get that word out. Um, and of course, you know, anyone involved with this group, you know, knows the importance and, you know, all the work that the group and, you know, the Greater National Wildlife Federation has put into promoting wildlife habitats. And, you know, you all are making such a difference because, you know, even if you don't thinking about insects directly, the work you're doing is helping insects. Again, it all ties into the native vegetation. Um, you might not have a natural community like we have in our nature preserves, but just by having native plants in your backyard is making a big difference. So, you know, creating backyard habitat and um, this is the kind of stuff we can all do that's going to make a big difference so we can all help to save our insects. Whew. <laughs> uh, yeah, really, thank you all for listening to all that. I kind of sped up at the end because I knew I was getting close and I promised I would do it. I would get it all in there. But, you know, like I said, that was a lot of information, but I really thought it was important to at least, you know, put that out there. I know I went through a lot of it really quick, but I couldn't. I, I couldn't rightfully leave any of it out. So let me Steve M wants to know how long it takes, um, or I guess what is the process um, for an egg to turn into a butterfly? What is the time frame on that? Yeah, so it's it's different for different species. So it can be just um, sometimes it can take ten days in the egg stage. Sometimes it could be a couple of weeks. For certain species, they might even overwinter in the egg stage. And the larvae won't hatch, you know, caterpillars won't hatch until the spring. So it all depends on the species. You know, I guess if you had to give an average for, you know, species that are breeding all throughout the warmer months, it'd probably be maybe about a week to somewhere between a week and two weeks, you know, in the egg stage and then several weeks in the caterpillar stage. Usually the adult stage is much shorter lived, um, you know, for and, you know, you'd actually think of some of like our moths, like the big giant silk moths, like luna moths. Um, they don't even have functional mouth parts. So you know, the, we, we think of the adult form as being the main form, but most of their life is caterpillar. And then the adult stage is really just for so they can fly and find a mate and get the next generation going. Cool. Thank you. Um, and I guess a related question from the same person um, wants to know, is there a process for notifying someone if you were to spot a um, lanternfly in Mecklenburg County? Like, who would you reach out to? If you oh, think that, that's a good point. Um, probably um, anyone that you can think of. <laughs> um, and I can, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a North Carolina Cooperative Extension with, you know, as long as that information eventually got filtered to them, they're probably one of the main groups that would really want to have that, as well as um, North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Um, so you can get them directly or if there's anyone at a, whoever you can get to first, if there's someone in a nature center or someone in a natural resources group, that's an easier contact for you. And then we'll filter that information to who it needs to go to. But yes, that is that is if, very important to report something like that if anyone was ever to ever see one. Forward the next question, which is from Donna, who wanted to know, oh, I just lost it. Are locusts and grasshoppers the same? They are. Yep. Yep. Locusts are a type of grasshopper. Um, certain species, none of our species here in North Carolina have that kind of thing, like some of the Midwestern species that produce those incredible, you know, populations explosions at times that, that they're so famous for. Um, and that's probably for the best. But yes, locusts are a species of grasshopper. Cool. And there's several different species of locusts, but they are grasshoppers. That was a good question. Um, and Ernie, Ernie wants to know if the Natural Resources Division ever works with the city of Charlotte to help um, them, I'm assuming like city leaders, um, understand the need for quality ecosystems, natural habitats, um, et cetera, to support insects and wildlife. Is there any collaboration between um, you know, the county and the city on that? Um, we, we know people and we've certainly had great conversations with a lot of people, mostly I think for in my dealings, it's been with a lot of stormwater related folks from the city of Charlotte, um, but certainly like working with Tree Charlotte um, and groups like that. So um, we are always happy to offer expertise out and we've gone out and have done biological surveys 
for a lot of properties that aren't ours. Some of them have been city properties and some of them have been for surrounding county um, park and rec uh, park departments and agencies. Um, and again, trying to impart whatever information we can. So yeah, we are always happy to collaborate, definitely. Great. And I'm scrolling to see. I know I had a couple of other ones down here. So we have a question about um, needle ants. I think just generally, um, Angela wants to know if you can discuss those. Um, see, I, that, and that, that's a great point. See, again, it goes into my disclaimer at the beginning. I don't know much about needle, needle ants. I know they're here. Um, and um, I, I've seen things. And again, I'm not even sure. Like there's something I've seen a few times recently where there's been mounds and mounds of dead ants together. Um, and they, and that, that is a thing that, uh, and I can't remember if that was needle ants, that were a species that does something like that, but um, they'll actually produce these, I guess, burial areas where they'll all carry their um, dead ants from colonies out into one area. And, you, and it's usually above ground. And all of a sudden you stumble upon this weird site of, you know, hundreds of dead ants piled up. And again, I apologize for having limited knowledge on needle ants, but for some reason that name came to mind with that. But um, um, ants are, there's a world of inform incredible information that we can find out about ants. And there's a whole other world of incredible information that we can't because there's so little known about them, especially some of our local species and some of the non-native species that have been introduced. So um, yeah, I, I wish I knew more, sorry definitely a good thing to look into and a lot of resources online for sure um yeah. we were talking the other day about how there are people who spend their entire career on one teeny tiny little group so right and in the meantime carla wants to know um about canker worms um i think specifically the ones that we do tree banding to prevent yeah and tell so their populations are kind of cyclic um and you know we we we, we hate them right because they're you know they, they're such a nuisance we know the damage they do to trees but again you know you think about those slides i showed you with the neotropical migrants you know their migration is kind of timed with the point where you're seeing a lot of the canker worm caterpillars so they're a major food source for migratory birds so you know when populations get really high that they drive us crazy and we know the damage that they're doing to to our trees, you know, how we, we're, how they can defoliate them when there's that many of them. Um, personally, I, I, it seems like the last few years, I haven't noticed a major big year for them. And a couple of times I felt like I've seen them starting and you know what, we know when it's gonna be a big year because all of a sudden you can actually like walk through the woods and it sounds like rain and it's just their droppings, their frass falling down on you. And we started to hear that, it's like, oh, the canker worms are going and then it just kind of stops. So. I don't, I don't know, I don't know enough to say um, how these population trends are with them, if it's normal or not normal, but it seems like we're having more off years than big years lately. Um, the adults fly in winter, so a lot of times you'll see moths at your light on warmer winter nights. Um, I do remember a few years ago seeing a lot more canker worm adult moths at lights than I've seen this winter or last winter. Um, you know, anecdotally, it just seems like looking at moths the way we've been looking at them for so long each year we're seeing a little less than we've seen the year before and um and, and i don't know you know I, I like it to be the other way around but um yeah so I, i'm sure we can expect more canker worm explosions but um i'm almost a little worried that we're not seeing more of them in the last couple of years than we have been Cool. Well, Lenny, thank you so, so much for answering all these questions. And I think actually I was scrolling through, I think that might have been it, but that's actually perfect timing because we're right on. Oh, oh can I to say one more thing? I'm sorry about canker worms. Um, this oh, is yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, no. You know, we put the bands up on the trees for them and that certainly really helps. But if it's not going to be a big canker worm year, and we kind of realize that early on, if you're not seeing the canker worms, take the bands off because it's disrupting the movement of lots of other native insects. And even when there are canker worms, there are native insects that'll actually go up in the county and feed on them too. So, you know, beetle movement or other things or even moth species. So yeah, you know, I, I know the importance for the bands sometimes in really bad years, but you know, we band every year and a lot of times they're just not out in those numbers and it's hurting a lot of native insects. So I just want to get that out there. Sorry, Caroline. No, no, that's excellent advice. Um, and I think something 
really obviously important to consider after everything that we've learned about insect decline this evening. So thanks for ending it on that note. Um, presentation and your talk was excellent. So we're just so appreciative to have gotten to um, spend a couple hours learning about insects tonight. So thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate you all sticking. Like I said, it was a lot, but just that awareness and appreciation is the key. And uh, as much I can throw at you to help build that, that's that was the goal. Cool. Okay. Does well, anybody? Just... Oh, there you are, Donna. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you, uh, Echo Caroline, and thanking you with the excellent program. Um, I know for a lot of my life, insects were really low on my list, but then the more <laughs> I learned about them. And the, the most fascinating thing is I got a jeweler's loop. And when you look at an insect through a jeweler's loop, it's like a 10 times magnifier. They're incredible. They're yeah. just the complexity. Absolutely. They're just so fascinating. And um, I have a whole um, collection of insects, of things that I find, you know, anywhere on the ground. I mean, they're, they're dead when I find them. I don't kill them. <laughs> right. You know, and it, my friend calls it my little box of horrors. But... Um, <laughs> But anyway, I really love sharing it with people, um, especially kids, you know, because a lot of them are, are like, you know, is that a bee? Can, you know, it's like, yeah, you can hold it. And um, and that's really cool. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I want to remind you um, to if you have not gotten your copy of Buzz Bite Sting um, or Extraordinary Insects, I hope uh, Lenny's talk um, really inspired you to dig a little bit deeper. It's a very readable book. I, I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, the other thing is plant pollinator uh, gardens in your yard, especially milkweed to help with the monarch population. The North Carolina Wildlife Federation has a butterfly highway program. You can go to their website and find more information on that. Or you can contact me or Caroline or you know anybody in Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. And last but not least, um, Create, get out there and create a wildlife habitat. It's a lot of fun to do as an individual, as a family, and you'll reap great rewards for it. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, and we'll see you on March 9th.